published in the NEGM uh, uh, in August. This was basically titled The Randomized Trial of Closed Loop Control in Children with Type 1 Diabetes. Published in NEGM in August 27th, recently. So, uh, a little background about what is it and what is happening. So, according to ADA, less than 20% of children with type 1 diabetes actually attain less than 7% of HPA agency. So, this gives us a vast, uh, I'd say, a loop or at least a lacunae of saying what we need to do, why is this happening despite so much advancement in diabetic technology. Now, coming to diabetic technology, we know from in initial how insulin was initially processed, how it came, but what about technology? So initially, in the initial 1990s, we found that there was basic function of the CSI, that is continuous uh, insulin infusion, where there was just in a pump, you could just adjust the basal rate, basal rate option, and the bolus setting. Now following that, it came to extended functions where you could choose the bolus calculator or bolus wizard was started to start to initiate. Now, actually, we, the phase we are in is in the sense, sensor augmented pump and real-time CDM. So what is sensor augmented pump, I will be explaining in a while. Basically, it, it senses what glucose is and there can be a cutoff of uh, glucose or hypoglycemia, which I will be explaining in a bit. And finally, the last stage, which we actually aim to achieve is the actual artificial pancreas. That is complete closed loop and not in our hands. And the entire AI or the uh, software will be taking care of that. With LGS, that is the low glucose cutoff. So, what was the aim of this study? So, this study aimed to assess the efficacy and the safety of closed loop system in children with type 1 diabetes in the age group of 6 to 13 years. The study was done in Florida. Uh, so now what was the methodology? It was a 16-week study. It was a multi-center, open-label, parallel group and a randomized control trial. Uh, trial. So what do you mean by open-label? So the open-label means that the study participants knew what they were going to get and they were informed about the intervention. So this is not a double blind. It's not a blind. So who were the participants? So initially they included children in the age group of 6 to 13 who had type 1 diabetes for at least one year, who had received insulin therapy for the past six months and the minimum total daily dose was more than 10 units per day, weighing uh, between 25 to 140 kgs. They excluded uh, children who had got, who had received OHS other than metformin and hemophilia obviously for because of multiple tricks etc or any other bleeding disorder. So I will just uh, explain briefly, I will explain in a while. Basically what they did, so they initially took the informed consent and they took the initial HP1C of the children and then they showed the in, uh, individuals how to use the device and all. So they initially divided the individuals who were already on a pump, who were on MDI and who were already taking like a uh, uh, close, not close loop but at least a sensor. So those who were taking MDI, they were explained how, you, how to use the sensor. The sensor used was a G6 Dexcom sensor. They showed them how to use, so they used a run-in, two to four week run-in time was there to explain how to use the sensor. And then they started randomizing uh, these individuals. So I'll be explaining. So this is what they did. What exactly is a closed loop control? So closed loop control means you have the pump, you have the AI or the uh, software, and you have the uh, sensor. So this completely removes any sort of control in the individual's hand. This is the pump which they use, which is T-Slim X2 insulin pump. This has recently been uh, put forward by RTA and told you can use it. And what standard of care is being used, at least in Florida, over there was mentioned that it was a sensor augmented pump. It means you have a pump, you have the GCM, but it cuts off the sugar, it cuts off the insulin uh, levels when you go into hypoglycemia. So that is the sensor augmented. But you still have to feed in your sugar before me and uh, right in the, uh, your, sorry, the RBS. So what it means by closed loop in that sense is, do you have to mention the amount of carbohydrate you're taking? So no, that is outside. You don't have to do anything in that. No, but how do you, how will that, no, how do you get the bonus though? That is it. But according to the sugar, sir. So they will not know that. So basically, I think there's, you need to be very clear about that. It is not, it is not mentioned that they're getting any sort of, it just mentioned it is completely closed. The so closed is mainly okay. in terms of your dynamic changes which happen with that regard. Okay. But of course, if you're going to eat a lot of carbohydrates that the pump is going to know automatically. So there has to be a mechanism by which you have to feed the data on that. 
So when you say closed loop, it means that your insulin will come down when your sugar is going down, when it's going up, it starts going up. Low glycemic suspend is just one uh, safety wall. As soon as it goes beyond that, you will have that. Otherwise, nothing. It was just an explanation of closed loop work. Basically, the glucose uh, sensor senses the glucose level. It sends the signal to the pump, and pump, according to the AI, sends the uh, uh, insulin site increases or decreases the uh, insulin level. And this is a sensor augmented pump. Basically, it's a send thing, but then you have to input user input and cutoff. So that's what it's so this is slightly complicated. I've explained it better in this one. Basically, what they did uh, first four weeks, they took did a screening. We are in run-in period, Sorry, sir. and then they randomized it to three to one. So it was divided into closed loop group and the stand stand uh, standard care group. And here, after the 16 week period, they again extended this group so that those who are getting standard of care, they could also get the treatment, this uh, closed loop treatment, and then see what happens after that. So, initially was the main phase study and then the extension phase. Now, if we go back to this, uh, as you can see, it has been divided into closed loop and uh, standard of care group. So, in the first week, there was a phone contact, and after the first week, they were told to come to the visit. And subsequently, phone contact visits were at 1, 4, 6, 10, and 12 weeks. And clinic visits at 2, 8, and 16 weeks. And then they got the primary outcome, which I will be discussing. So what was the primary outcome in this case? So what they actually aimed at was the percentage of time in the target range of 70 to 180. Then other secondary outcomes were what was the percentage of time more than 180? What was the HbA1c at 16 weeks? And what was the percentile target in hypoglycemia less than 70, less than 54, or hyperglycemia more than 250? Other safety outcomes they considered were severe hypoglycemia, defined as. So, uh, why did they not choose HPA once in the primary cell? So, according to what they have seen studied earlier, it was not a very good, I mean, there have not been much changes according to. See, if you, it, it's, a very, it's a very philosophical thing to think of. If you are very hungry, you will first like to eat something. Then you will start thinking of something else. Once your stomach is full, then you will start thinking of art, science, and all those things. So if your HbA1c is 12%, you will get it controlled first. But once you already are already on a sensor augmented pump, which is pretty much a dream for most people out here, by that time your HbA1c should already be fine. So now what you're trying to do is to fine tune it. So only if your stomach are filled, you will start thinking of new music, raga, and everything coming out of there. So this is there. So they have evolved to a level when the basic is sensor augmented pump. Sensor augmented pump you are trying to downplay but it actually already means that you have a continuous monitoring of glucose which is giving data which is actually doing a suspend also. So a lot of things are happening. So whether by doing something else how will you improve the residual? So now if you build a new technology you will say that now this will do something. So you say that okay this Apple Watch was measuring your food steps, how much calorie you are burning, all those things. Now the next one is taking a receipt. The next one is taking a saturation. So you're trying to build up the level. So then they found that okay, glycemic variability may be better where we can have a difference. So you already reached that level. Like you already reached uh, uh, 100 meters in 9.9 .9 seconds. So how do you do? You will do a maybe microsecond or something. So this is the next incremental increase. It's not a drastic increase. Uh, basically, if you say no insulin, insulin, you will have a six percent for an HbA1c. Insulin from uh, mixed split to basal bolus 0.5 to 1 percent. Basal bolus to pump maybe zero. Even basal bolus to pump, the difference in insulin is less. Studies have shown that if you take a 2 into 2 table of people who are on insulin pump and CGMS, so conventional insulin plus CGMS, conventional insulin no CGMS, pump CGMS, pump no CGMS. Which will be the worst in terms of HbA1c? Nothing. Uh, conventional, conventional. Love. so basal bolus with no CGMS, no which would be the second. CGMS with MD? No, CGMS with uh, pump without CGMS. Pump without so just having a continuous monitoring may have a better improvement in terms of control. So you are already on CGMS, you are already on pump. So what will further benefit will happen is that you are looking at maybe your TIR may be there. So if they had used hba one c it would never be different. So that's why it's very important to choose your outcome measure. And they are also saying that they are looking at variability. We are not looking at actual glycemic control. 
because that and then they are thinking it does become very important. So that of course will be a, a secondary phenomena in that setting. So how did you do the statistical analysis? Now sample size, that as we discussed initially, what happened is they to get a 90% power, they initially took 60%, 60 patients and randomized into three to one. But then they they the aim of doing the 60 patients uh, was that they get at least 10% difference in uh, pre and the pre intervention post intervention. But then they went on to take 100 so that they get better results. So they have taken 100 patients. Better results, my. How you get better results? The sample size increased to 100 to increase the number of patients with exposure to the closed group. So what it means is that if you increase your sample size, your minor differences will also be seen. So what they're saying is, that earlier we thought 10 percent is significant. Now we say 2 percent is significant. So you're changing your goalposts. So you have to be very clear as to what you're looking at. So you need to know whether that is clinically significant for you or not. So that we'll discuss next. And uh, as we discussed, this analysis was done on intention to treat patients. Mm -hmm. So now if you go to the results, uh, initially 101 patients were there. Uh, in the closed loop group, 78 were there and uh, standard of care divided 23. And one patient could not uh, show the results at the end of the trial, but he was in, also uh, included in the trial. Now if we see the reports here, this is so the no p-value. Yes. So that's a big lesson that no, you don't need to write a p-value mm -hmm. if you have a good randomization. So what is uh, interesting here is that the age group, as we've discussed, is 6 to 10 and 10 to 14. The duration of diabetes was mean at least 5 years and uh, in the control 6 years. And you can see that means of insulin, they, 62 individuals of 71 were on insulin pump as such discussed and only 16 were on MDA, which is actually quite opposite to what we might face here. And uh, as you can see, so many, 72 individuals were on continuous glucose monitoring. So they were pretty much at the highest yes. level. They are already the society is so evolved. Mm -hmm. You start thinking of uh, literature and art and everything. Start thinking from there. Uh, here, this is also very important that their baseline mean was 7.7 HP1C. .7 and uh, and despite all that, 92% CGM, 89-90% pump. Still, it was 7.7. So, getting 8.5 is very easy to speak. It's very, very difficult to achieve. Uh, HbA1c at randomization of this. And the one thing is daily insulin dose. Now, mean units of insulin is 0 0.9, 0 0.89, 0 0.5. So it's pretty really similar in the two. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to say. Okay, so this is. So coming to the efficacy outcomes, so this may look a bit complicated, but uh, what happened here? As you can see, the primary outcome, uh, the range of 70 to 180 at baseline was in 53 individuals, which then improved to 67. No, not 53 individuals, 53%. The IR was 53%, which increased to 67. 67. Yeah, so there is a 15 uh, yes. time increase, which means that there is a 30 percent increase in time and range. Still, 33% is remaining. Now, that's the big issue is still happening. And despite all that you have done, you actually give in a closed loop system, but another thing, okay. one third of the time is still not ending. So, there are so many other factors which are there. And uh, even in the control, there was minimal increase, but definitely no, one, not ending. It's it's hardly the same. Statistically, same. And there was improvement of 11 percentage points. So yes. what they're saying is that, of course, just having CGMS is not good enough. If you do not act, it is not going to help. Here, what you're happening, you're monitoring and the pump is acting. So of course, your fine tuning will be better. This is what it is coming. But still, there are unknown variables, which are spending those 33 percent still there. Uh, glucose level more than 180, as you see here also, this was reduced, like uh, from 45 to 31 in the closed loop. And in control, it's from 47 to 43. So here also, they have set in minus 10 percentage points improvement. Of course, so they will improve that. So people will not come back to this. No. So somebody, so when your timing rate is improving, you will obviously, your hyperglycemia and hyperglycemia will come down. These are all the same things. It's like a playing with the same thing. Even glucose level, as that is only the same from 183, came down to 162. So this is Now, what is important here is that there was no improvement in glycated hemoglobin as 
we were not expecting as it so 7.6 is went down to 7 there is some improvement is there so like there it came down to 0.3 and minus 2 but that's fine which, which we that's what they are so if they had made hdmlp as their primary outcome the study would have failed so they are clever to start off so i think if you this may be a more conspirational sort of a approach but the fact that why are we shifting from hpmc to time and range study there are so many talks talking about time and range being the metric and this is the most important thing probably because now you, it's very difficult to show a measure to be efficacious with hpmc so now people name it's important we don't know but hpmc is a robust measure which is there for 20 30 years so we have to wait for time and range but what is happening is that because changing time and range is easier than hpmc that's why people are shifting more towards time and range now what they also mentioned is because hbmc was not significant so the other three like so the seven less than 70 less than 60 less than 60 did not consider that so they did not consider it all. yes uh, one more thing, one what it shows is that what is it doing it to is the it time? To, what is doing to the blood sugar? What do you think? There is no difference. Or uh, see, if you now look at the amount of time, less than 54 was 0.1 percent. So anyway, their time was very very low. In the hypoglycemia was very rare. It was mainly hyperglycemia which was happening. So what this intervention has done is that that hyperglycemia had come. Now you can't reduce 0.1 to 0 is of course not possible. But what it's trying to say is that it is better to decrease your curve which is like that to down without causing hypoglycemia. Any intervention that decreases glucose is a risk of hypoglycemia. But this is not increasing hypoglycemia which is a positive. The one main goal they have taken uh, is that the 70% of time in 70 to 80 mm -hmm. and less than 4% hypoglycemia was significant in percent to maintain CLC more than these are all post hoc measures which are not related. So this is a box chart which shows like the timing uh, in the baseline it, as we mentioned in that the initial change was only in the initial few months of the therapy year. This was and here it shows uh, the end of chart shows that the this is the figure that we're talking about. It's mainly the peak, peak. which is coming yeah. up. That's why that peak is coming down, which is improving, especially at night time. Yeah. Is that true? So actually, what this is saying that the most of the sugars were high overnight. Yeah. yeah. So especially night time, because that is the time that your meals are not ready. It's mainly what is happening. So you're not doing anything. Your pump is working. Now here the pump is automatically changed. So the major advantage is nocturnal hyperglycemia is being cut. So, but what this is trying to show, I think, is like the sugars in the closed loop group were higher in the. This is the closed loop group, and this is the control group. So, this is randomly showing that the percentage of time. Okay. This was higher in the. Uh, no, no, this is percentage of time in range, no? Yes. <laughs> so, okay, the percentage in the time of time in range. range. So, it is keeping in the range basically much more. Okay. Now, so it is working more at night time. Because the, that is the okay. most important thing, as I think. Because that is, you are not dependent on meals. You just depend upon your uh, endogenous production and that could I eat. When you take meals, it is not it is no different. In the morning, the time in range is the same. What it's saying is that night time, time in range is better for food. So the big message, I think, is that when you are independent of your meals, your uh, closed loop is doing better in the afternoon. So safety outcome. Uh, per se, there were no serious outcomes we can see here. This one serious outcome was actually gastroenteritis, which is unrelated to the uh, main thing. No DK, no severe hypoglycemia requiring any assistance. This one uh, hyperglycemia uh, over here uh, so yeah, uh, was because of some pump failure, otherwise there was no failure issue. Now, uh, coming to the discussion. Uh, what we mentioned is that yes, the timing range that is 70 to 80 was 11 percentage points higher than the sensor augmented pump. This means 2.6 hours less time per day, in the sense more hours, more time in the time per range than other hours. Especially at night. At night. Uh, the beneficial effect seen most in first month and as we mentioned, overnight monitoring. And hypoglycemia frequency was low in both. In obviously because of the low glucose suspend, they have mentioned that. Yes, that's a big point. So, how will you have to make it better when you have already had the low glycemic suspend? So, 
So it is very good in hypoglycemia, but that and if you had a high glycemic bolus, that blood type you're close to, that will take care of it. So now it's very, very clear. So basically, low you had already taken off here because of the low glycemic system. So none at hypoglycemia. But high you are not taken care of. Now you have got just added one more thing that you give more insulin when your sugars are high. That's why it's coming now. Especially at night time, right. because that's the endogenous production. Did we even see they agree to the fact that there is insignificant yeah. change from baseline in both groups? Fine. And less than seven percent attained by a higher percentage in the group. And the goal of target range that was I mentioned that it was much higher. That was the goal of being in target and not having hypoglycemia. This was much higher in the closed loop. Hmm. Uh, there was no severe hypoglycemia or DK. Now the strengths of the study, uh, there is no restriction. Like they have taken HV, no restriction based on prior HV1C. But I would feel their main HV1C was seven. So they are pretty good patients. They did not have many patients with DK in blood. There was no history of any severe DK or hypoglycemia, but they've taken patients who had. It won't make a difference. If your HV1C is 10, you will improve. It will pop up. So, I think that's that. Near 100% patient retention and high adherence according. And the limitation is they are they agree that it is not fully representative of the general population. An amount of hypoglycemia. I mean, amount of work that would have been done with every patient in terms of teaching, counseling, mm -hmm. talks, and everything becomes very, very important. How much will it cost for this? If you do not take the sensor properly, what will happen? So all those things are there. A lot of people actually switch off automatic mode. Many people they yeah. mention about that in best when you have actual uh, closed loop systems, people where they get too much alarm and everything. Okay, okay. So they switch it off. They go to manual mode. So this is all something which happens in a real time. First okay. uh, Because of the predictive suspense. And trial period was very less than just four months, not that much. So, so four months is good enough to tell you the sugar in the short term. So, so as what we discussed here, if we take the validity of this uh, would we consider? I mean, generalization, of course, I would not consider in India. So this is, no, see, it doesn't matter. So, if you have very bad control, if you are on pump, you will do better. It's a very, so, this is the biggest part of it. This is a biological plausibility. One thing what you're doing is that you are just suspending glucose when the insulin and the glucose is low, which improves, so which is already shown. Now, you added another thing by giving more insulin when sugar is high. So, this is a very logical thing. So yes. probably it doesn't make too much sense to do that much study to really evaluate that. This is a better technology of delivery. Now the issue is not that. The issue is basically whether it's applicable or not in that sense. So I don't see any issue in terms of validity. And they're very, very clear that HbA1c will not improve. Even from a CDMS, from a basal bolus to a pump, HbA1c may not improve. This is again they're coming back. But time in range does improve at night. This is the only advantage you get. This is the benefit. That's the cost. The take is your how much take is going to be there. The impact on our but or no, I would not be living. At the moment, we don't have any way augmented therapy itself is so expensive, close loops are going to be there. But this is important to understand the perspective. So